Hi, this is Justin Coletti from Sonic Scoop. We're here with Mr. Chris M. Zane at Gigantic Studios in Manhattan, New York. Chris is an amazing producer engineer. Uh, we're big fans of his. He's worked with artists including Passion Pit, The Walkmen, uh, Sobe Sexu, Friendly Fires, St. Lucia, a lot of really cool stuff. I think Chris gets some really unique sounds. He's able to do things that sound really polished, things that sound really gritty, things that sound really organic, things that sound really processed. And he'll often kind of combine those elements. We want to talk a bit about his process, the tools he uses, his approach to making records. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming. Cool, man. So the first thing I want to ask you about is kind of your approach to layering sounds. I feel like there's a lot of layering going on in some of your biggest work. I think of things like Passion Pit and layering organic drums with processed drums, synthetic drums. Right. What do you look for when you're stacking drums? It's usually more of like a feeling than a, a frequency. It's more of just like a, it's not there yet, it's not there yet, keep it in the oven for another minute. Keep poking at it until I feel like, oh, uh, till it's like, hitting me hard. And I think yeah. one important thing to clarify is there's a big difference between triggering drum samples to a live kit mm -hmm. to make it sound better and what I'm doing, which is recording drums right. and then programming drums that are not necessarily doing the same thing and sure. putting those together to create this thing that sounds maybe real, sounds kind of fake. You know, that's kind of my end goal is I want the listener to say, I don't know if that's real or not. So yeah. something I might do is program drums using real drum samples. So you get this weird feeling of synthesis, but the sound is still pretty organic. Or maybe I'll go through a lot of trouble to try to get the real kit to sound like a drum machine, to get a snare drum sound that's like, psh, that's just like really low, punchy, quick, no buzz, no harmonics, no ring, none of that. I'm like right. the opposite of all that is good and natural and organic. And one of my kind of famed tricks is that I will sometimes take the snares off the snare and I will very carefully go in with needle nose pliers and I will cut every other strand. Mm. So there's half as many snares because if I go doom, 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 I don't want to hear zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> I just want to hear doom, doom. Psh. So I can spend a lot of time manipulating the real drums before they're even recorded sure. and supplemented with samples. You know what I mean? So it's just a lot of role reversal and kind yeah. of playing with perception. So the processing right. starts in the real world. You can start with acoustic yeah. instruments. And obviously, looking at how much gear you have in the racks, it, it looks like it doesn't stop yeah. there. And another important part of that process is the parts, is the arrangement. So very early on, I'll try to identify, like, maybe I want the live kit will be way more sparse, mm -hmm. and it'll be a lot more like a puka, puka, And then it will be filled in with programming. So in the end, it's really filled up and subdivided, but it's about yeah. trying to find the right way to make it click totally. together. And I love that uh, part of your approach where sometimes I don't know where the synthetic drums end and where the real ones begin. And do you ever find it useful to have bands to track along to a pre-recorded rhythm track? Or do you find you get better results when you're starting with your organic drums? Well, I wouldn't say that I necessarily always start with the real drums and add the synthetic drums mm -hmm. or vice versa. I think a lot of times it might be fairly programmed and I'm like, you know what? I want to add real drums just to give it like a bit of whatever, you know, and the band, they'd be like, wow, you can't even hear them. Right. But you can, if you take them away, you can hear the difference, you know, sure. like just having some of that, like something that I use the word all the time is teeth, mm. having this teeth on it, this like mid rangey sound, guitars and drums fill in a space, a frequency notch that can sometimes be overlooked with, you know, drum samples. But as far as like a method of the band, I mean, I don't know, I feel like there is no, there is no method anymore. There is no order. It's not very often that I'm recording a record with like a band in the live room and we're playing all together and then mm -hmm. we're overdubbing. I feel like some people probably still make records like that. I, it's not very often that I do. It's, sure. it's quite a bit of it is pretty built up. I was just working on a record where some the live drums would be the last thing to be added to a song. Right. And then on other songs, it'd be like the second thing. Sure. So it just kind of depends on where I think they're going to sit in the architecture of the drum mix. Yeah. 
Right. I noticed you didn't say first thing though. So uh, it, if you're going to start with the first thing, is it usually not drums? No, probably not because I feel like you need a reference. You need a point of reference, you know? Sure. And this is something that you'll probably hear me talk about later in mixing is like kind of just popping something on even if it's totally not in the right place yet. Just to like hear really quick because it's very easy to get something that you think sounds awesome right. and then t like a couple hours later you're adding stuff to it and you're like, Right. Sounds really small and dinky. Yeah. Um, so yeah, depending on how prominent I want the drums to be, which most of the time is pretty prominent, <laughs> I might wait a hot minute. You yeah. know, and I think some of that is also attributed to the way that a lot of people are making records today, starting it on their own, working on it on their own, demoing it, whatever you want to call it. And I often encourage people to bring that in and let's start mm -hmm. from there mm -hmm. because it seems odd to take a step back. And even if in the end, none of that stuff ends up in the, uh, the record, right. it just seems like a good place to start. And I think it can be easier to just go in and be like, oh, we can make that better, we can make that better. And then slowly but surely you start raising the sonic bar sure. and it forces you to just get rid of all the old stuff and Right. Do it, so, so this is really interesting. I think one of the things that a lot of new artists don't do enough of is, you know, demoing their stuff really thoroughly where, oh my God, this is so good. I wish we had recorded it for real. And then they go to the studio rather than maybe just going to the studio and hoping for the best. So it's cool to hear that you encourage that, but it seems like you're taking it a step further where it's not like, let's just have the demo for reference and then come back to it and see are we doing better, but you're actually layering on top of a demo. Sometimes I'll be the first person in the room to yeah. be like, yo, that's dope and we're not gonna beat it. So right. let's just, trust me, let's just save the six hours now right. where we're inevitably gonna go back to this one little beep, boop, boop, boop sound <laughs> and let's just use it. That's, there's a sign hanging here that says don't overthink it for a reason because yeah. if it sounds good, Let's just use that. Sometimes all you can do is just improve on a little bit and knowing that and having the yeah. you know, ego to be able to step back and say, I don't need to prove I can do it that much better. I'm well, like gonna... I said, I think that it maybe it comes in steps. It's like sure. you improve on one thing and another thing and another thing and slowly but surely you're like, oh, you know what? We've demolished the demo now. We can get rid <laughs> right. of that. But if you just from the beginning just say, let's try to make that better and redo it, maybe you'll get a little lost, you know. Sure. I don't know, I think it's just about kind of like following the little path and cool. then see where it takes you. Very cool and I have to be unafraid of uh, taking that approach. I want to ask you a little bit more about the layering thing because, uh, you know, in other interviews I've seen with you, I want to hear more about it. It seems like you can layer a lot. Like on some of the Passion Pit stuff we're talking about, I think vocals 20, 30 deep, and I've heard the same about uh, some of the guitars with a, a Sobe Sexer. Sobe Sexer. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are you looking for when you're doing that many layers on something like a vocal? I think uh, different things it, on different records in different yeah. periods, right? So like back in the day, I feel like what I was probably looking for was like a cheap way to make it sound good because yeah. I couldn't make it sound good otherwise. <laughs> um, on Passion Pit in particular, which was on the first album that was a pretty prevalent production piece was the mega stacking of vocals, especially in the chorus. Yeah. I can't even remember why or how we did it. Very, a lot of things about that record were just, we just did it on the fly. We didn't think about it too much. It sounded good and we liked it. We just kind of went with it. And that's, yeah. I think comes out in the record and that's why it sounds so fun. It has nothing to do with like, somebody can't sing and they're trying to make it better. I think it just sounds cool. It's like putting an effect on a vocal by different means and you know, sure. these means are stacking it up 20 times. It gives you a different sound than recording two vocals and putting chorus and distortion and all right, that. Like, right. it just it just has a particular yeah. sound. In recent albums, I've continued some of that, but in a bit more of a constrained way. Like, so on the new St. Lucia record, we did quite a bit of quadruple vocals in the choruses. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we made sure to do is we would get the lead the way we wanted it, and then we would double it and triple it and quad it mm -hmm. in real time and not just like, yo, just do a bunch of takes and we'll pick the best ones later. Like We would sing to it and punch it and go along. And what we found is it was faster, it was mm -hmm. more accurate, mm -hmm. and yeah, it just yields a different result than sure. just doing 20 takes and picking four randomly or putting tons of effects on or whatever. It just 
It's just a certain sound. It's like anything yeah. else. It just, yeah. Now with uh, a band like Asobi Sexu, where there's uh, a lot of guitar-driven stuff going on, and you're layering them, are you looking for juxtaposing guitar tones, or is it more the texture of same guitar tone, let's just hit it with additional texture? A little bit of same, yeah. or if it's different, it's probably not much different. I mean, Asobi, that's kind of a classic wall of sound thing, where we just wanted some huge and heavy, so it wasn't about trying to hear the different, the little minute differences. Right, right. But it was like, how many of these guitars do we have to put in before it sounds like Loveless or before it sure. sounds like whatever, you know? And yeah, we just we would just put lots of different guitars, and sometimes that means just changing the pickup. Sometimes that means totally changing the amp, whatever. But again, you know, <laughs> I think it's just one of those things where like it wasn't scrutinized. Like we just kind of did it. I realize that's kind of a lame answer, but I also think it's the the right answer because yeah. it's something that people, fans today seem to veer away from. Mm -hmm. You know, they all overthink it so much and they're all so desperate mm -hmm. for that instant feedback and gratification and they want to put a song up on SoundCloud and read what Pitchfork had to say about it 20 <laughs> minutes later that yeah. It handicaps their ability to just like go with their gut and say, yeah. you know, screw it, I'm gonna Are just do whatever. Too many new artists too concerned about doing things the right way or trying to search for, is there a right way to making records? I don't think they're concerned about doing it the right way. I think yeah. they're concerned about doing it the coolest way that's gonna get sure. them the most um, cred. Gotcha. Yeah. So well, sometimes people do things in the studio that are counterproductive just because they think that'll give them the best story to tell later? I mean, I'm not even gonna answer that. <laughs> Of course, yeah. That is a rhetorical I question. I think that sometimes bands, certain bands need to build a house, tear it all down, and build it back again mm. so they feel like sure. they've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that house is different or better or the same, that's a different story. But I have seen on more than one occasion that um, people do seem to kind of gravitate towards that screw it, we gotta do it all again, you know, because it does feel quite dramatic and can make you feel accomplished, you sure. know? Well, yeah, I guess when you're making art, how you feel about the process of making it colors the way you hear it in the end. It's so. a complicated dynamic because I do this every day. That's all I do. So right. I'm just making records and I'm just like happy to just make them. Yeah. But these guys, they only do this, you know, once every two years right. and they have to go tour it for 18 months and they yeah. have to live behind it and it's a big thing, so I wanna make sure they're really happy with it. But at the same time, I don't want them to overthink it so much that they squeeze any and all life out of it, totally. you know? And it just becomes this thing that they've spent too much time, like, calculating. Yeah, I know what you mean. I wanna go back to the guitar thing really quick. This is a great avenue to go down, but before we go down further, uh, I think you're really known for drums. We got to talk about that a little bit. And you're a drummer, I think people seek you out for what you do there. But you also get, I think, really amazing guitar sounds. And uh, I've heard that you kind of are into keeping a very minimal guitar path. Can you tell us what that signal path is about? And if it is so minimal, what do you look for when you're looking to adjust tone? I'm not a like guitar nerd. So I just approach it like I approach anything else, kind of, which is let's just get the sound that we want Right. and then just record it, yeah. you know? The specifics of how I typically record a guitar, which is almost always the same, mm -hmm. super straightforward. I usually just stick a Royer 121 mm -hmm. on a really good amp with a really good guitar and a cool part, and that's it. Whatever pre I've got hanging around, one of my knees, one of my sure. Avalons, maybe a little bit of compression, no, nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. not, not three microphones, right. I'm not blending microphones, I'm not doing any of that. Now, I don't say that as some kind of purist, because I'm right. definitely not like some purist. That's just how I happen to approach guitars. Because you can do so much with it in the physical world before it even hits a mic, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I just think anyway. that's, truth be told, that's probably where what we all want is coming from. Like, yeah. maybe we could get it across the finish line another way, but if we know what we want, like we should probably just spend the extra 10 minutes. You know, I think yeah. that's one of those things that you learn like, after like a decade is like, you know what? I'm gonna spend the extra 10 minutes and just get this right now. Sure. My wife is, works in fashion photography and she does a lot of retouching. Mm -hmm. And I watch her do this retouching and she'll spend three hours removing, uh, you know, a wrinkle or a frizzy hair. Right. And every time I walk by the computer, I'm like, why didn't they just, Literally, somebody walk in and be like, excuse me, and just like fix it yeah. and move the iPhone cable and be like, all right, let's take the shot. 
And it's because they're busy or they didn't think about it or whatever the reason is. But totally. I feel like I have learned kind of over the years and, and from her sure. that it's so much faster and easier to just get it right. To yeah. just like, hold on, I'm going to go move the mic, I'm going to fix the amp, and then we don't have to think about it again. Rather yeah. than be like, it's cool, it's cool, I'll just, uh, I'll fix it later. Ironically, part of the rub that is this world we live in is the better the artist and the better the gear, the less you have to do, right? It's sure. that kind of catch-22 of life. So not everybody has the opportunity to record a 60s 335 through an awesome vintage Vox, right? right? I don't expect everybody to do that. But I think there is the same, that core lesson in there that can be applied to other stuff, which is like, let me just get the best guitar I can, plug it in, try some things, then just record it. Sure. Well. <laughs> now, with just using one mic, I think one of the things that makes some engineers nervous about using just putting a Royal 121 up there is it can be a really fat, throaty sounding microphone compared to like a SM57. So when you're working a really dense mix like you often do, I mean, do you find yourself just tracking brighter guitar tones than you normally expect or just rolling off some lows at some point? I mean, I do notice that if you stick a Royer 121 in front of a pretty juiced up tube amp, you'll get all this crazy sub stuff. Yeah. Why just get rid of it? Who wants sure. that? Nobody wants that. So I get rid of that. And yeah, when it comes to recording guitars, especially with ribbon mics, I always say it's a bit like Broadway, right? If you see like a Broadway actress running around buff backstage before the show, mm -hmm. you'd be like, damn, why does she have so much makeup on? She looks so crazy. Yeah. But then when you see her on stage, it looks right. And the reason is because she's got to get to the person in the last row. She's got to get all the way out there. Sure. And they've got to see and experience the same thing as the person in the front row. Similarly, I think when recording guitars, sometimes you have to overcook it a little bit. Right. And uh, the amount of times that I've like, been in there and be like sounds perfect and then i walk in here and i'm like why does it sound so dull and quiet right you know and then i go back in and i give it two more clicks of treble and mm -hmm. one more click again and i walk back and i'm like yeah that sounds right mm -hmm. so i've kind of learned that lesson over the years that like we might get the sound yeah. and then as everybody's walking back into the control room i'll go K -k -k -k, and i'll know that mm -hmm. when i get back in there it will probably sound pretty much how it was sounding when we were all out there i, I like that idea of it's not just about making it sound great in the room. It's got to sound great through the speakers in context. And sometimes that requires something different than what in your instincts tell you in the room. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's no question that if you stand in front of a loud guitar amp, it's going to blow you away. Right. I and mean, you're going to walk in here, it's probably not going to blow you away. Sure. And it shouldn't. Maybe it shouldn't blow you away. You yeah. know, like, it is going through all this stuff. And sure. you're hearing it in a different context now. So I think, yeah, you've got to, like, adjust for that. So it's very simple, basic. You know, I have pretty much one guitar here that I use. Can I ask what it is? It is a 62 Jazzmaster. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of those other guitar sounds that people think I did something special about recording, like let's say on the Walkman, for example, yeah. I feel like I didn't do anything. You yeah. know, Paul's an amazing guitar player. He has an absolutely ridiculous guitar, an amazing amp. Mm -hmm. He knows how to use both of them. I mean, I think on those Walkman records, to be honest, what I remember is putting a Royer four feet away and turning it 90 degrees wow. or 180 degrees. So we weren't even like... That's you know, like the null point of the Royer. So it's almost like a room mic rather than a direct mic on some yeah. of that stuff. And uh, Interesting. I mean, you can't do much more or less than that without recording it. So, yeah, right. you know, it just sounds incredible. They're, they're an awesome band with an awesome sound and, you know... I, yeah. I, I don't want to. I don't want to take credit. But I, fair enough. But I have to admit, turning a Royer ninety degrees away from an amp four feet away to me as an engineer is a kind of awesome and ballsy thing to do. Because so many of us, I mean, for me, the, my first several years doing audio stuff, I would never do that. Particularly if it was my one mic, I might do it with an, you know, as a second mic that I won't even listen to, and maybe that'll sound cool. But just to have the confidence to say, sounds good. Let's do it. I mean, that's huge, and that's something I guess you can only develop. You keep on doing it, keep on doing yeah. it. Yeah, well, I also think that's the, probably the best part about this job, right, is for me, it's not just the satisfaction of finishing stuff, which I think is what I really love about it, but it's working with different people, right? Sure. It's like you come across all these different personalities and they inspire you to do stuff differently every day, whether it's they ask you to or whether you just, for some reason that right. they're like, I feel like doing this. And yeah. I think the best thing for me about this job is if I want to try something like that, but I, I'm on the fence about it and I say, hey, 
dude, I'm thinking about doing this. Like, yeah, do it. Yeah. I kind of will take their confidence mm. and fold it into mine. And I'm like, and then I feel like together now we're both kind of making this decision. Like, let's try this thing. Yeah. And sometimes that's when the best stuff happens. You that's know? huge. If you can get a positive feedback loop where you and the artist are both giving each other confidence. and Or the opposite. Yeah. Or they're like, dude, that's terrible. And I'm like, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and vice versa. So, I meant in general. But yeah, there's got to be times where it's just like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm saying that every single day. Yeah, of course. To them. So I'm happy when somebody says it to me. Got to do it. I, I think that record making is like an extremely democratic process. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's not my album. I'm not on the cover. And I know that that's the opposite thing a producer should say. It should be me, 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 and my sound, and my this, right. and my that. But that's just not how I approach it. You know, I encourage people to to challenge me <laughs> and vice versa. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.